Okay, so we've got Mr. Lacoste Shasta. And does he have other ratings? So he's got a 1500 or so bullet and a 1900, um, I think not rapid, but classical. Let's play Carol Can here. And let's go ahead and take this pawn. And one move that is quite popular lately, I actually um, have recommended it myself in the past, this move knight f6, uh, the so-called Korchnoi variation with e takes f6. On the one hand, it looks like having these double pawns is not very um, attractive, but on the other, it turns out that this kind of beef it, beefs up your king side, right? So you're gonna castle, and when you do, uh, it's gonna be harder for your opponent to uh, to attack you because you you have he can still attack you of course if he castles queenside etc. Um, but it's going to be a little bit trickier now. White can play the way that um, White has played so far, but here after the move bishop to g4, the pin suddenly it turns out is quite annoying. So in other words, playing very normal maybe the most natural moves in the position bishop d3 and castle leads to this pin, which is not the end of the world, but it is a little bit annoying. How do you get rid of that pin? Um, the only way that you can get rid of it, there's only two ways. Either you push this pawn, which creates a bunch of weaknesses in your position, in your king side long term, or uh, you drop the bishop back. But if you drop the bishop back, that's kind of annoying because you first place the bishop here trying to place it on an active square. So um, sort of sucks to have to then uh, drop the bishop back. Uh, I myself maybe will drop the bishop back here. I'm not sure. My idea is bishop back and then put the queen on d6. I guess that will force uh, force this move. Let's let's give it a shot. It's it's a reasonable uh, reasonable move, I think. Queen d6 probably, as I say, he'll react with g4 because otherwise my idea would be queen d6 and then take and then uh, check. Although what he might have there against queen d6 is rook here. And if bishop takes, queen takes, queen check, king here, queen check, he runs. Um, and if I give a check here, he blocks. So that's an option. Um, so maybe, I, I can't remember against this setup, is bishop c7 the absolute best move or not? Um, there's, there's other moves here that make a lot of sense to me. Rook e8 is one of them. Um, and knight d7 is the other, just developing pieces, rather than a piece that is already developed to move it a second time. Okay, but he goes a3. I really don't like this move because it's, um, you know, it, it's a move that where the idea is play on the queen side, but the action is happening on the king side. Um, so... The move a3 is designed at just covering the b4 square, <clears throat> but I don't really see why you need to, to care so much about the b4 square. Ah, but he goes g3 in response to queen d6. I actually, for some reason, missed that he could just uh, take this approach instead. I'm going to go queen d5, though, um, and pin him, and I think it's quite an uncomfortable pin. He probably has to play a move like bishop e2, and then I'll go rook e8. And uh, after bishop e2, rook e8, I'm actually, it should be noted, I'm not threatening to take because after queen takes, after rook here, rook takes, queen takes, takes, then queen check and uh, mate. So I'm not actually threatening to take. And that makes me want to play something else. You know, if it's not even coming with a threat, maybe I should move the, move the knight. On the other hand though, I'll go rook e8 anyway. And the reason why I've chosen ultimately to go rook e8 is I kind of want to bind his queen to the defense of the bishop. Uh, if I go something like knight d7, I create no real problems for him as yet. Uh, so I'll put the rook here, and now you know he has to be careful what he does, uh, what he does next. So he goes c4, which makes a lot of sense to me. 
But the question is here, for example, can I go queen e4? And already the fact that I played rook e8 as opposed to a move like knight e7 gives me some, I think it gives me more uh, opportunities here. Because now when he defends the bishop, now I feel I can absolutely take here on f3. And the point is after bishop takes f3, then queen takes e1, uh, the rook is hanging. So I think, he, I think the game is just over. Um, if on the other hand, I had played in this position knight d7, and he went for c4, and then I went queen e4, he could have absolutely gone rook e1. So I preferred the order of rook e8, even if I didn't have a threat, because I created more pressure on his position. Okay, so he has taken. And now we'll continue with uh, normal development. We're very happy to leave the rook here on e1 um, because it ties down it ties down his pieces here. So he's going h4 probably just because it's very hard to find uh, find useful moves in his position. And now I just need to try and find a way to break into his position. One way that I could actually force more material gain is bishop f4. If bishop takes, then rook takes uh, would be the point. There's a part of me that wants to be even more greedy because for now his pieces are so stuck here that I, I feel like I could maybe try and find an even better idea. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Uh, greed in life is is often uh, regarded as a, as, a, as a vice, right? I mean, it's not often, but it's regarded as a vice rather than a virtue. But on, on the chessboard, it can be a virtue to, to try and be greedy, um, greedy when you can be, without being unreasonably so, right? But but some of the some of the best chess players I know they're incredibly greedy, right? Whenever you on the on the board, right? Whenever you get whenever they get a chance to 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 you know if they see an opportunity to get a pawn. They won't. They'll make sure that there isn't an opportunity to win. You know, two pawns at the at that in that in that moment. Uh, so here, for example, my patience I think has paid off uh, in terms of moving the knight and just trying to get get at this structure. And so I go knight b three, and and now I'm I'm winning a full piece, and my opponent uh, resigns. So thank you for the game, Lacoste. Um, and yeah, the problem is, as I say, this opening the course noise variation. It's very interesting. Uh, and it's not easy. And you can see that at the highest levels, the way Lacoste actually played with the white pieces, it's been played by someone like Rajabov, uh, for example, this particular setup. It's very reasonable. But you can see that even at the master level, Black is actually scoring more than more than his fair share, more than 50%. So it's a very, um, very interesting uh, opening. And, and Grandmaster from England, David Howell, one of the, the top British GMs, he is... Um, He's, he's maybe the, the world's the world's uh, greatest expert on this line, or or, or if not, he's, he's he's one of them, um, and his results are are incredible with this line. So um, <clears throat> he actually sold me a bit on that line <clears throat> almost a year ago, and uh, and and showed me some some of the key points of the of the line, and and uh, yeah, I've only I mainly just played it in rapid and stuff like that, but it's been it's been a very nice weapon.